moms in particular get a ton of unsolicited advice. And I would just say pressure from people outside the family to do certain things because it's, I'm doing a little air quotes so you can't see, but it's just the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And be one the of mom. those, yeah, be the mom, mm-hmm. Tr- love them. Like they're your own, mm-hmm. which like, but never mind that that doesn't even make sense for people like me who had no of their own to compare that to. So right. and that's not a helpful thing to say no. to people navigating this role. Welcome to the Nacho Kids Podcast. Good morning. Good evening. It's morning. Good morning. <laughs> what is no? But one of the one of the news channels used to do that. They would <laughs> they would end with you know good morning, good evening, good night, or good morning, good afternoon, good night, or something. Because, you know, they had a worldwide audience. Yeah, I don't so remember that's that. kind of how they would end. Anyway. No. Well, we do have a worldwide audience, but yeah. Yeah. We'll just so say again, happy day, y'all. Happy, happy day. day. <laughs> happy day. Happy day. All right. There are still a few more days left to leave a podcast review. Take a screenshot. Send it to us at contact us at nachokids.com to be entered for a $100 Amazon gift card. That's right. I don't want to hear nothing about you ain't got no money when we're trying to give you some for free. Right. <laughs> so if you have not done it, do it. Everybody can use the extra hundred bucks. You have done it. Do it again. <laughs> no. <laughs> One entry per person, David. <laughs> All right. Our guest today is the anxious stepmom. Okay. Michaela, she needs to take the change of thing thinking challenge. Yeah, that's what I need to tell her. <laughs> Michaela, she has been blending for 12 years. And she talks about how her stepmom journey started with a panic attack. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. I met Michaela, quote, quote, met Michaela through one of Claudette Chenevere's networking things. And I immediately liked her. Not only is she got such a beautiful little face but just she was great to talk to so i had to have her on the podcast y'all mm-hmm. like if i enjoy chatting with you you getting on my podcast <laughs> we're gonna chat so everybody can hear it yeah she has no kids of her own mm-hmm. yeah her husband has two sons when they started blending the ages of the kids were three and five so now they are teenagers. Yep. Happiness and joy. Yeah. It's fun how things change. hmm <laughs> David, <laughs> I hate that you missed this interview because she talks about how she had moved because of work. She had went on the online dating site, right? hmm Met up with somebody. Didn't care that they had kids because she was moving back to California later. So I said, well, as David would say, you were looking for a booty call. (laughs) (laughs) I said, sorry, sorry. My inner David was channeled or something. I don't know how. (laughs) But it's like, you came out of me, David. It was scary. I'm like, you must have been looking for a booty call, Michaela. (laughs) You're so inappropriate. (laughs) Me? (laughs) You know you say that all the time. I say that sometimes people go from friends with benefits to friends with conditions. <laughs> and then they end up in a situation ship. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but no, it was great. It was great talking to you, Michaela. And for any of you that don't know, I don't always, well, I rarely have even a topic to talk about with these people other than blended family stuff, right? hmm So a lot of this podcast turned into talking about panic attacks. Mm -hmm. which I think is what needed to be talked about. Yep. Because I have them. Not to the same, not the same way that Michaela has them. My sister-in-law has them. And they're very scary. And it's important for people to understand that this happens to other people too. Oh, yeah. I mean, my first one was during the whole divorce thing. Oh, we never talked about you having a panic attack, David. Yeah. Well, it would have been probably not a divorce thing. It was probably during one of the the pre-divorce events. I'll say that. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That a nice I, I got you. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> that a nice way to put it. <laughs> well, 
now you've seen me have panic attacks. Yeah. Because I, I do have them frequently. It just depends. Yeah. But was your panic attack like mine? No. Like your yours is more physiological. Like mine is I don't think you could I don't know that you could tell it from the outside. Okay. It's um when I like had inner them, turmoil. Yeah. When I had them, it was yeah, it was like inner panic. Mm-hmm. Kind of the, you know, if your house was burning down and people were inside of it kind of feeling. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's uh, somewhat of a bit of hopelessness and at the same time feeling of something, you know, you've got to, you've got to do something immediately. You got to do something right. immediately or or something bad's going to happen. I don't know. It's hard to really explain, but it is kind of like an overwhelming feeling of panic. That's kind of a, yeah, that's why it's called a panic to, attack. Yeah. yeah. Simple way to put it. Or some people call them anxiety attacks, but yeah, it was, it was a very panicked feeling. Uh, or the bad thing is it's like, there's nothing, there's nothing to panic about. Like there's not a immediate something burning down, but your mind thinks it is, but you feel that way. It wasn't that my mind thought it was, it was just more of a, it's just more of that's how it felt. Even though there was nothing there, like there was no action that I needed to take immediately, but it felt that way. Right. Internally. Like if I don't do this, somebody's going to die kind of feeling. Yeah. Really, I'm surprised because I don't know that we've ever talked about that. I mean, I, I know we've talked about a lot and how things you told me about how you felt when things were going on, but you never mm-hmm. used the word panic attack. If you did, I don't remember it because it just shocked me when you said that you had a panic attack. But that reminds me to tell people you're not weak because you have a panic attack. No. You're not weak if you have trouble controlling those panic attacks because it's a mental process. Yeah. I think for me, when it hit, it was kind of a, oh my God, what are you going to do? And you're overwhelmed with what are you going to do? Because you do, for me, when I did it, it was, there, there are things that have to happen. There are things that need to be done because of the circumstances or, or what happened or whatever. And then you start playing out all the different scenarios like here's the 12,000 different ways this can play out right and i need to understand all 12,000 of them just to make the right decision mm-hmm. that's what it felt like yeah so yours was completely different than the ones i experienced yeah i don't have them like just out of the blue some people do like yeah. they don't even know why they just have them i don't they're they're and i've not had many but they are they are very much tied to something that's going on Well, I say all that because one of the things that we talk about in this episode is when I have a panic attack, your reaction to it. You know, there's been times that I've called you or I've beat on Jackson's window to tell him to go get you just because I feel like I'm dying. Mm -hmm. And I know you don't know what to do, but over time, we've talked about how I just need you to tell me it's okay to kind of just help me relax a little bit Mm -hmm. or to help me get some type of air flowing near my face. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, bring me a fan or something, but you don't have that urgent reaction to it because you know in your head that I'm going to be okay. Right. But in my head, I'm thinking I'm going to die right here, right now. I can do CPR. Oh my (laughs) God. (laughs) <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? So I can't expect you to react like I do because you don't understand it. Mm-hmm. And that's like your sister talks about her husband. She's like, he's useless. I'm <laughs> like, no, he's not useless. He just doesn't understand it. They don't know what to do for us because we're standing there with our eyes all big, wanting to fight, flight, run, freeze, all that stuff at one time. Yeah, it's, it's not, I don't think it's a, I don't, I don't think the word understanding, like you don't understand it is not as accurate as I'm not experiencing it at the same time. Right. Like if if you and I are in a car accident, we're experiencing that event at the same time. Right. If you're having a panic attack and I'm not, then there's different, there's a different viewpoint of it. You're panicking. And I'm like, there's nothing to panic about. Well, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't mean I'm discounting what you're feeling. It's just, I'm not experiencing that. And so I'm looking at it going, you know, what is it that you need me to do? You need a fan, mm-hmm. you need whatever. It's going to be okay. You know. The worst thing you can do is act like it aggravates you. 
Yeah. How long is this going to last? I got work to do. See, see, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> that is the worst thing you can do is to like go to somebody having a panic attack and go, what do you want me to do for you? Or what yeah. can I are do you, for you? Are you done yet? Yeah. <laughs> or just act like it's an inconvenience. You know, because yeah. we can't help it. I mean, I'm sure I could probably get on a bunch of drugs and be a zombie and not ever have them again. But mine are not triggered to, I want to say events as much as it's just like something clicks in my body. And when I say that, it's because like with you, you had an event that Mm -hmm. caused you to have a panic attack. Right. Mine, we could try to figure out, okay, when it's hot outside or when I'm doing something and bent over, that's when I'm more likely to have them. I mean, we can go that way, but it's not an event. So it's not as easy to go, what caused this? Yep. And so I laugh because remember, remember I sent you a screenshot from my phone a few weeks ago. It said my heart rate was like what 180 beats per minute or something like that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you're like, I'm coming to get you. You're having a heart attack or something. No, I said you're in SVT. Yeah. Because I have SVT, so I know what that is. So and I'm and I'm like, what is going on? And I look at I look at the timestamp on it and I realize this is, it was exactly 12 hours earlier. So I didn't see that it said 2 a.m., not 2 p.m. Mm-hmm. That was kind of weird because it was exactly 12 hours. And then I was like, wait a minute, I, was, I wasn't even wearing my watch at 2 a.m. Yeah, it was on the table on the nightstand. Yeah. So apparently my nightstand <laughs> was having a panic attack. <laughs> was having a panic attack. <laughs> <laughs> but it did, it alerted me again. I, I think it's one of those things where I just didn't see the notification until later in the day. Mm-hmm. But when I saw it, I was like, what the crap? Why, why is my heart rate? And I was feeling my chest. I'm like, my chest, my heart rate doesn't feel like it's that bad. And I'm oh, checking well, my pulse. And, I know. Yeah, I was, it was really freaking me out because I'm like, I, I don't even feel it. How's this happening? <laughs> well, let me ask you this, David. When I have an SVT attack, mm-hmm. which my heart rate goes from 60 to 140, like, bam. Your response to that's differently, I think, when I have a panic attack, an SVT attack versus a panic attack. Mm -hmm. Because the SVT attack, I don't panic anymore. It's more frustrating and aggravating. Yeah. The first time it happened, I thought I was dying. But yes, there's a potential you can still die from an SVT attack, but it's not, I don't have that fear as much. It's more of just calm down hard. I can't, you know, you get dizzy. The effects from the physicalness part of it. Well, I probably have a more severe reaction to the SVT attacks when you have them because they're something that's physically happening to you, whereas panic attacks are just just a mental thing. Right. Even though they can, well, they can still make your. Not that I'm just, I'm not discounting it. I'm just saying there's something that's the SVT attack. There's something actually physically happening to you and your heart rate and it, and it can cause some major issues if we don't get that under control right. pretty quickly. Whereas the other is like, okay, there's nothing really happening here, like physically happening. Well, so I don't we know, just to, your heart rate can go up with panic attacks. I've never, I don't know what mine would be. I've never right. had your, a, but it, measured. Yours before. doesn't go up to the same degree. Right. I'm not saying I'm not making a comparison between the two other than the comparison between the two as it relates to you. Right. Right. Somebody else could say, I completely disagree with you. Mine is, but I, I get it. I'm saying for you, one you is different physically than see it on me. Yes. yes. Because my shirt's jumping up and down. <laughs> yes. Versus the panic attack. All you see is that fear in my eyes. Yeah. Well, it's like, yeah, you have a panic attack. You need a fan. Yeah. <laughs> you have an SVT attack. Okay. We've got, we either got to take medication, do some kind of, Vagal maneuvers. Yeah, that. Or we got to get you to the hospital. Yeah. So it's different. There's, there's something different happening. Yeah. And the time frame in which to get this under control is different. Right. So. Well, and I will say, after so long of the SVT, you know, you are supposed to go to the hospital and get the denison to basically restart your heart. And the first time I had that done, it scared me to death. So <laughs> that whole SVT thing, it scared me the first time it happened. Then I kind of got used to it and I understand it. I understand why it happens and ways to stop them when they occur. But 
when that first time when they gave me that medicine and they're standing there with paddles. <laughs> yeah, that kind of freaked me out a little bit. I said, what are you doing? I know. They said, I well, that's just in case your heart doesn't restart. I'm like, what? <laughs> We're yeah. doing a reboot. We're doing a hard yeah, reboot. Exactly. Which actually, for anybody that has SVT, which is supraventricular <laughs> tachycardia, they know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Of how it just makes you feel. And if they've ever had that medicine, they also know that it's crazy feeling. But anyway, I want to get off that topic. I don't want to have another one. <laughs> yeah. Talk but between up. the two, I'll tell you, I'd rather have an SVT attack. Wow. 100%. All right. Well, we've talked a lot about panic attacks. And yes, it's... we have. So now I'm panicking that we've talked too much about panic attacks. <laughs> All right. So let's get to listening with Michaela. And again, check her out. She's the anxious stepmom. She's mostly on TikTok. Her stepson helped her get on TikTok. And listen to some information about panic attacks. All right, here we go, folks. Okay, Michaela, I am not even going to try to pronounce your last name. <laughs> I was going to try, and then I said, no, Lori, let's not make a fool of ourselves today. <laughs> but I want to try. Can I try? Go for it. Bucchianeri. Lori, I'm not even flattering you here. I've got lifelong friends who don't pronounce it that beautifully. You nailed it. Really? Yeah. Woo, go Lori. <laughs> now you say it. Bucchianeri. Look at there. What I a beautiful you. last name. Well, thank you. I talk about people's last names a lot, like Claudette. Oh, Chenevere. Chenevere. <laughs> so I'm going to start going Sims. <laughs> All right. So, Michaela, tell us about you, girl. Yes. So, I know that kind of the, the typical place to dive in is my stepmom's story began when I met and fell in love with my partner. But, Lori, if I'm honest, <laughs> my stepmom journey actually began with a panic attack. I had been dating my now husband for about six months. I had met his two sons who were three and five at the time. And we'd planned a little play date. So this is not the first time we'd met. It was just going to be a fun, fun outing. And we did have fun. We went to a, a children's museum. We went to a little diner afterwards and had burgers and shakes. And they dropped me off back at my apartment. And my younger stepson, who was just three at the time, was just grinning at me. We had such a fun day and he whispered something to his dad and his dad said, sure, you know, you can ask. And he looked up at me and he said, can I give you a hug? And I mean, I was just heart eyes all over the place. It was so sweet. His warm little cheek pressed up against me as he was hugging me. I was just like all smiles riding up in the elevator. And I walked into my apartment and shut the door behind me. And suddenly there was like a ringing in my ears and everything was going gray. And I felt like I couldn't catch my breath. That was your warning, girl. <laughs> that was the sign. And, you know, I think, I mean, you talk to a lot of stepmoms, Lori, and you are one. So I don't know what your perspective is, but I think that's a place many stepmoms get to either like me way at the beginning or later, much later, maybe when they just reach a breaking point where things aren't working in the family. And you say to yourself, I don't think I can do this. And there's no shame in that, but I do believe what you do next can make all the difference. So yes, that's where I started. And I'm happy to say we've come a long way since. Well, keep going. So you went in your apartment, you had a panic attack. <laughs> and then you what? mean like what I do the next hour? Okay. So after yeah. some soul searching of whether or not I really could do this, I thought, okay, your new you haven't had a panic attack in a while, but you're no stranger to anxiety. And so that's kind of an earlier part of my story is that I dealt with anxiety off and on for many years. I mean, most of my life, if I think about it. And what's interesting is by the time I met my husband, I had gone to school for clinical psychology. I had a doctorate. I had devoted my career for the past, you know, 10 years to supporting people who were struggling with things like anxiety, things like panic attacks. And so I knew, I knew what was going on, but this was, I will say I was feeling it in a whole new way. And, you know, 
fortunately I had some, some good tools at my disposal. I had a history of coping with this kind of thing. And so I got myself back into therapy. I connected with all my supports, people I trust. I did some reading, probably too much reading on (laughs) the family life. And what I quickly realized was that if you're going to start looking for the places you could get stuck or the problems you're going to encounter in this role as a stepmom, you'll have a lifetime set of hobbies on your hand uh, looking for problems because you'll never run out of them. They're, They're everywhere. And each problem, if you poke at it enough and you attend, you turn enough of your attention to it, it seems to morph into like 20 new offshoots of problems. And that's before you even open your mouth to talk to your partner about it. Then it multiplies into (laughs) exponential problems. Yes. And so for me, this did not happen quickly, but with a lot of work and with some support, I started really shifting how I was viewing this role. And when I shifted from viewing stepmotherhood as a series of problems to be solved and focused instead on skills to develop, everything changed. And suddenly the actual problems we were confronting, I had I had an actual method or different ways that I could support myself in tackling them. And the beautiful part is when you take more of a skills approach rather than just, you know, problem whack-a-mole in step mm-hmm. family life, you find that you're able to solve those problems more efficiently and hopefully with less collateral damage. But then those are portable skills. Suddenly I could apply those same skills to other relationships, to friendships, to difficult situations at work. I mean, if you're willing to put in the work and it is, it takes effort. Like this is not an easy role. No one's saying that it is. I really have found like it, it expands your life in all these really fruitful ways. If you're willing to put in the time to become skillful at it. So fast forward to now, you know, life is not carefree or simple, but I can, I can genuinely say it's fun. I have a lot of fun being a Mm -hmm. stepmom. And I, I think that's everything to do with some of the ways I changed how I looked at this. It's easy to fall into the negativity. I've got so many questions already. Okay. How long have you been blending? Well, it's been over a decade now. It's been about 12 years. Okay. We're going on 15 this year. Goals. (laughs) (laughs) And how long after dating did you get married? We waited a while. I think it was three and a half years. Oh, that is a while. Yeah. Yeah. And looking back to me, it felt fast. I never once felt, Lori, like we were slow rolling it. Really? Yeah. And I will say, like, we were pretty aligned, you know, like we talked about it early, my husband and I, but he initially, in fact, one of the things that really attracted me to him was the fact that he was so appropriately cautious, I felt, and certainly very protective of the kids, not wanting to introduce them to someone new too quickly, wanting to be really thoughtful about kind of his next steps. And I appreciated that. And it fit really nicely with me being scared out of my mind about yeah. the prospect of being a stepmom. <laughs> but I one of my first most important lessons that I had to learn in this role was just the experience of unsolicited input from people around us. And I don't say that to fault anyone. Like these were some of our nearest and dearest people. But like friends, you know, extended family would comment on the fact that we'd been together a while and when are you two going to get married? And it's like, if we'd really given that, if we'd placed a high priority on other people's sense of timeline and how we were falling in step with that, I think we might've rushed some important things. Right. Because the process, we weren't just biding our time before we were getting married. We were, we were taking, I mean, I inched my way like a little inchworm closer to becoming a stepmom. I moved into a new town, not too far away, but to be closer to uh, my my husband, my boyfriend at the time and the kids. We got engaged. 
it was all just very, it was kind of like a methodical, methodical process. And, you know, I, again, I'd love to tell you that it was because we were so wise and we knew exactly what we were doing, but you'd see right through that. If I said it, it was, (laughs) (laughs) it was very much like a combination of, I think, healthy caution and off the charts fear. Yeah. And my fear was more at the forefront because I talked about it more, but I know he had some fear. I mean, I think any parent, how could you not? There's always that lingering question of, is this going to last? I mean, we've, we've been through so much, he and the boys, as every family does. Right. When things change, it's a lot. It's so vulnerable to put that on the line again, even with someone that you're growing to know and trust. It's a lot. Yeah. Now, had you been married before? I hadn't. No. Okay. So this was your first marriage. This was my first marriage. And do you mind my asking if you are child free or childless? I don't mind at all. And I love talking about it. Um, I call myself child free. I'm child free by choice. And that's a funny thing I understand to say as someone who loves being a stepmom. But I had decided shortly before I met my husband that. I didn't want to have kids. And, you know, I had my own reasoning for that. But the shortest way I can express it is I care about and respect kids too much to have them without really, really wanting to have them. So that's a good answer. Now, well, it was the truth. And it took me a long time to get to that for all sorts of different reasons. You know, it's a whole whole set of mind hurdles that many women go through in making that decision Mm -hmm. because it's not the expected path. And so I got to a place where I was really comfortable telling everyone around me like, yeah, I I don't think I want to have kids. And And they're like, what? They're like, what? But no, I mean, the people, I don't, I don't know that it came. Maybe it shocked like my grandma or something, but I don't think grandma. I know. But then, then I surprised her with my beautiful Michaela. (laughs) <laughs> then I then I surprised her with two stepkids. So she yeah. loved that. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> so when you met him, how did you meet him? We met online. Ah, uh, another David Lori story. Yes. And I know we've chatted about that. And I think, I don't know, I feel robbed personally of all the fun online dating stories because <laughs> yeah, he was my first date to come from online dating. It was a very short-lived process for me, but. Oh yeah, me too. David's the only one I met. Yeah. Yeah. When you met him, I'm sure his profile said, I've got kids. Oh yeah. So your search, I'm guessing, did not exclude people that had kids. (laughs) No. And you know what? This is probably, I'm a little embarrassed to admit this because I should have known better, but that wasn't even on my radar. It didn't even dawn on me like, oh, there will be divorced parents in this pool of people I could be dating. It just wasn't something I'd spent any time really thinking about. Really? It wasn't. And I think partly because at that time, I wasn't looking for a person that I would spend the rest of my life with. At that point, I was just, I was living in a new place. I wasn't sure how long I was going to be here. Um, As David would say, a booty call. (laughs) (laughs) That's what he would say. You know he would. David's words, not mine. Yeah. (laughs) And I think like, yeah, a friend of mine once put it, she said, you two were just looking for signs of friendly life out there. You know, we'd both come out of long, long long-term relationships. His was a marriage. And it's like, you're just looking to have a nice conversation with someone. We did not expect that it would be such yes. an instant click, but it was. And then I had a whole new set of questions to confront because yes, he made no secret of the fact that he was a dad and that that was a huge part of his life. But that didn't cause a panic attack. That didn't. Because you were still looking at it from a friend perspective versus yes. a future relationship. Exactly. And I think, I yeah, mean, David I don't... having four kids didn't bother me because of the same thought process. And really, Lori, it doesn't it go back just to those expectations? I know you you two talked about that recently, that expectations shape everything. And sometimes, like if we're entering into 
a sit, you can have two separate sets of people entering into a first date, but if their exp expectations are, this is forever, like I have my list of qualities I'm looking for, like the stakes have never been higher, you're going to have a different perception of that date Yeah, than someone who's just looking to have a nice conversation with someone. You know, that's funny you say that because as soon as you said that, I thought about Branson, one of David's triplets. I had to tell him to stop asking people on first dates certain questions <laughs> because he would go to the whole, do you want kids? Where do you want to live? Because he was in the military at the time. You know, your financial goals. I'm like, no what? No wonder this isn't working out. That's too much at one time, dude. Too much. He's bringing some real forever energy to that first date. Well, he's like, I'm not wasting my time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can't blame him, I guess. No, smart. <laughs> yeah. So, obviously, when that little boy hugged you, mm -hmm. it's when you realized that things were different or yeah. changing. Yeah. And I find it interesting that you say you went back to your therapist. And I'm trying not to laugh when I say this. <laughs> because it's just so real. And I don't mean to laugh like in a funny way, but it is kind of funny. Because you were doing great in life. And all of a sudden, the thought of being a stepmom sent you back to therapy. <laughs> Lori, the punchline writes itself. And I'll, I'll piggyback on that. I was... In many ways, I had never been doing better than I was <laughs> right before I met my now husband. Yeah, I mean, career-wise, I was, it was a really exciting time. And I was, I had completed like this level of education in my field that, I mean, that was just a dream at one point that I could get there. And it's not lost on me, the irony that <laughs> my specific area of study like lends itself directly to what I was about to experience. But I think for me, I mean, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that that wasn't my first ever panic attack in life because oh, yes. I think a couple of things probably would have happened. I mean, it was hard to navigate after that, but I think what would have happened is that like most people, when they first experience a panic attack, they think they're dying. They think yes. they're having a cardiac event. Mm -hmm. Most panic attacks are still diagnosed in the, the ER. I think that would have sent me. <laughs> um, but I also think if that had been my first panic attack, I would have attached an unfair amount of significance to this relationship and the prospect of becoming a stepmom. Because what we actually know about how anxiety behaves and how panic manifests in the body, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Like, oh, there's a huge threat in front of me and now my body is going into panic mode. Mm -hmm. In fact, we just had a beautiful day. I was feeling peaceful and happy the whole time. It was... I mean, what many people who deal with anxiety will tell you is it's not just the times when you're under significant stress. Sometimes it's the good times when nothing scary is coming down the road, the calendar looks clear, relationships are peaceful, and something inside of you, even if you're not aware of it, is waiting for the other shoe to drop. Mm -hmm. And I think that's I think that's part of what was going on for me is I was both managing a high level of stress and demand on the work side of my life at the time. But I also was recognizing this is getting real. This has the potential to get very real. I have now not just one, but three relationships that I'm embracing by being part of this. And yeah. it just, it's, it felt very vulnerable. And I expected that there'd be a whole pile of shoes about to drop. So I yeah. think that's what was going on there. Mm-hmm. Well, I have panic attacks too. Yep. And they suck. They do. There's no way to truly explain them, I feel like, because to me, it's that fight or flight feeling, but the panic part of it has your heart beating so fast, you feel like you can't breathe. Mm. So you don't have that flight strength, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. But you feel like you could just run across the yard. It's like you're trying to escape your body. Yes. 
And I remember the first time I had one, it was not a pleasant experience. At first, they thought I had asthma. Mm -hmm. Exercise-induced asthma is what they said. Because when I would the exercise... tightness in your chest. Yep, that minute two to three, I felt like I couldn't breathe good. Yeah. And I would see my chest rising and falling, but I still felt suffocated. Mm. And so we were playing a laser game at the, with the step kids, and I think Jackson was there too. But anyway, I started having that feeling. I felt it coming. And you know it happens in a second. Yes. And I felt it coming, and somebody shot me and distracted me. And so I started shooting them, and I didn't have a panic attack. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I had been able to interrupt it. And by being able to interrupt it, that's not asthma. Right. So I've realized like some of what my triggers are, but mm -hmm. it is 100% mental. Yeah. Which uh, makes me mad. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Like, it feels, feels unfair. Yeah, it is. But I'm glad that, well... I'm not glad that you have them, but I'm glad you understand them because my sister-in-law started having them. Mm. And she told me, she said, I'm so glad that you understand what I'm feeling because her husband's like, get over it. Because what he sees on the outside is a type of panic, but not what she's feeling. Right. So he doesn't get it. Right. On the surface, it can actually look, it can look like the person's frozen, actually. Right. Or... You know, some people are more vulnerable to it when they're in crowded places. And mm -hmm. so in those situations, you have the added component on top of the considerable fear is the embarrassment of, oh, my gosh, what if I lose control right here in the middle of this theater or yes. wherever? And so people go completely it's like they freeze in time. And so they might not be responding to what people around them are saying. Their facial expressions might go really flat. They might even look frozen. Mm -hmm. And that's a very mysterious set of signals to the people around them. So, you know, a lot of this takes practice. And as you get to know your triggers, as you said, you can let trusted people around you in on it, you know, like your, your partner or whomever, but that's that's something that's another really hard piece of this is that you know your loved ones it's it's a very helpless feeling for them to not know how to support you in that right and the embarrassment thing like you said oh my gosh that's it it does it just multiplies it yeah yeah for sure and you know you mentioned it's all mental and that's part of what i love that you were able to differentiate between an asthma attack cuz it's you, distraction helped you in that sense and i right. think you know, there are a lot of cool, you know, thinking back on the clinical side of things and supporting other people. I've been able to help people with a lot of little behavioral activities they can do to test. You can almost run a little experiment. And so one of these is, you know, you wouldn't be able to stand there right in the grocery aisle, you know, the, the empty grocery aisle and do a couple quick jumping jacks if you were having heart failure. Right. But if it's a panic attack, you might feel silly but better to feel a little silly and know for sure right then, okay, it's anxiety. It's anxiety in my body. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what it is, is we get caught in this loop where our body is sending us signals all the time for all different kinds of things. So we'll get, you know, our heart rate will kick up briefly, or we might get sweaty palms for really no reason at all. But when we are conditioned to be hyper aware of those signals in our body, we start making a lot of meaning of it. And so that tightness in your chest, suddenly you're attaching significance to it. And you're right. imagining the last time that you had a panic attack and you're trying to prevent that happening. And what that does is it just fuels that cycle. And so a lot of anxiety is really, anxiety tries to trick us into thinking that we're fearing something else. But what we're really feeling is a fear of feeling afraid. It's like we right. don't want that feeling in our body. And like I said, you have a millisecond. Yeah. Yeah, it hits on something really primal within us. And it right. feels like everything you know is out the window in that moment. And it's, you know, for anyone who's listening and hasn't had one before, I want to I don't want to paint an unfairly grim picture. It's not like if you have them, you're powerless to do anything to prevent them. You know, Lori gave the great example of being able to use distraction mm -hmm. as a technique. There are lots of other really simple ways you can kind of come back into your body in the moment. So singing a song that help. Have you tried that? Yes. 
And? I sing Jesus Loves Me. Does it help? It does. You heard it here. There's actually some great research about humming or singing, particularly a familiar tune, can stimulate the vagus nerve, which is implicated in our stress response. And so you can actually build more capacity to fight those panic triggers. Which also affects SVT. Did you know that? The vagal nerves. It's all connected. Yep. They teach you how to submerge your face and eyes. Yes. You know, the pressing down, coughing, all that stuff. Yeah. Because it's a distraction and it interrupts, I think, the physical effect Mm. that this mental stimulation is having on your body. Yeah. But now the SVT is not mental. Right. 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 Yeah. Now, I know too with me, it helps if I can, now I'm not going to do a jumping jack because I already feel like I'm suffocating. (laughs) Right. (laughs) See me in the store doing a jumping jack, I'd fall on the floor. But I can distract myself with colors. Mm. Like if you're in the grocery store, look at the colors, find orange, find yes. blue, or an anchor thought. And I have the sweetest anchor thought. It's my baby boy in the bathtub mm. with bubbles around his sweet little face. <laughs> and that's my anchor thought. And if I can interrupt that process and throw that anchor thought in there before it gets to a certain point, I'm good. I love that. It's like magic. I mean, I know it's not magic, but it feels like magic. Right. Some people, and you know yourself, like that's the beautiful part is you get to use what you know. Like, yes, anxiety manifests in certain predictable ways, but we're all unique. And so use what you know about yourself from living in your own body your whole life and kind of pull out a best guess at what's going to support you. So having that, that anchoring thought, some people, it's like a a verbal saying that they mm-hmm. go to like certain words, or it could be a song. I love that you gave the example of colors because sensory information is one of the easiest and best, like most effective, quickest ways to calm everything down and bring you back into your body. Because you might've heard people talk about a symptom of a panic attack being a sense of like you're not inside your body or that you're not really here. It's a very surreal yes. experience some people have. And one of the quickest ways to like keep your feet planted back down on the ground is to tap into your senses. And so a really simple technique that works equally well with adults and kids is, you know, five, four, three, two, one, look around and identify five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell. And then if you you can do one thing you you can taste if you've got a taste in your mouth like from what you ate or gum or something but another bite the you, dirt girl bite the dirt. <laughs> yeah, another one is like one thing you know for sure. So it could be your anchoring thought or it could be, you know, um I'm wearing sandals today. And it sounds almost stupid simple, but by the time you get down to one, and again, you're not announcing these unless that helps you, you can do it just privately, internally, without saying a word. So say you're in public and you've got that embarrassment that you're going to lose control. By doing that, you can just bring yourself back down to earth <laughs> mm-hmm. and you're going to be much more equipped. You might still feel the trigger, but you're going to be much more equipped to take a reasonable next step, to go find the person you're there with and tell them you need a break outside or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing, you know, I'm not into forcing silver linings um, in every <laughs> step family situation, but sometimes they're there. We just need to look for them. And I will say for step moms, I mean, I've worked with so many step moms who deal with anxiety and yes. there's often this sense of guilt that it's going to impact their step family. Like they're not able to be, you know, they're, they're not able to uh, support their partner in the ways they'd like to, because they deal with that. Or maybe, um, I don't know, there's sometimes there's conceptions that it's going to rub off, that it's going to like rub off on the kids or something. And in fact, what we see usually is the opposite, that if you can find simple developmentally appropriate ways of talking about it, it's actually like a superpower you can bring to your step family. It helps them develop empathy for other people who deal with these different challenges. And chances are one or more members of your step family is going to experience 
some anxiety, if not necessarily, you know, we've been focusing on panic attacks, but right. anxiety is a really broad spectrum. Everyone experiences some flavor of it at some point in their lives. And stepmoms who, I mean, look at me, for example, if, if when one of my stepsons was feeling anxious as a kid, if I'd come in and said, well, based on my X number of years of schooling in psychology, <laughs> da, 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 da. Or would does that make more of an impact on them? Or if I came in and was like, oh my gosh, I know that feeling exactly. Sometimes I feel like I've got gummy worms slithering around in my stomach. I hate it. I hate that feeling. Here's what I do. Do you want to try this? You get that buy-in that just kind of helps them feel less alone. And so, so many stepmoms have been able to actually take the challenge of anxiety or depression or any other kind of emotional wellness issue and spin it into a superpower that can actually serve their families well. I like the way you put that. You Thanks. put a Chick-fil-A spin on it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I know, well, let me ask you this. Let me back up. How often did your husband have his kids when y'all got married? Uh, 50-50. And they were, uh, we've been on a 5 two, schedule the whole way. And that was in place before you came in the picture? Yes. So there were no changes to the custody arrangement when I entered the picture. Which is good. Yep. The less changes that can be blamed on you, the better. Right. And when y'all got married, did you notice any change in your relationship with your stepkids? Let's talk about that. You know, the little boy hugs you. Yeah. Yeah, the sweetest can be, I'm sure. <laughs> and so they're teenagers now. Yeah. What's your relationship like with them now? And what was it like throughout the years? Mm, well, I mean, I'll answer the last part first. Okay. Our relationships are really close now. I'm I treasure my relationship with each of them. And they share some similarities, those two relationships, but they're also different in some key ways. And so I can share a little bit about that, but I wouldn't say, I would say we were kind of over anticipating changes in our family dynamic when we got married. Most of the changes have not necessarily been anchored toward, they haven't been anchored to any big milestone in our family. They've more yeah. been influenced by things like, I would say more like things going on in the kids' lives that if I'm honest, had very little to do with the fact that we're a step family. In other words, you know, like the jump from elementary school to middle school. Right. Right. Yeah. That the that normal is our, nuclear family challenges that totally, yeah. but the fact that we then have, you know, so maybe it would be something that's like a super minor challenge, or maybe not even a challenge, but suddenly when you introduce the extra layer of complexity that comes with being a two household family, you know, now there's the extra stressor on kids of like, okay, now I'm in middle school, I'm playing team sports as a middle schooler, and now I've got more stuff that's going between households or there's extra complexity because of the scheduling or we've got, I'm just thinking of like sports examples, but we've right. got away tournaments and they don't necessarily line up. Like the people who could take me don't necessarily line up with the schedule in writing and how are we going to navigate that? And that's not for the kids to deal with, but it's just like an extra reminder that things aren't necessarily it's not good or bad. It's just an extra layer of considerations that we have to go through because we are a step family. And so I would say that's more of it. Honestly, we we really didn't see big changes when we got married. It, yeah, it's really been mostly things to do with what's going on in the kids' lives. But I fully expect that would have been a different story if I was coming to the relationship with kids of my own, mm -hmm. but that wasn't our, our situation. Now, did you live together before you got married? We did. Okay. So you, you lived together. Did you come in with telling the kids to do things? Not necessarily parenting, but hey, little Johnny, put that up. Go wash your hands for supper, blah, blah, you know, things like that. Did you step into that kind of that motherly role? with them in your home? I didn't. 
And, you know, again, in hindsight, I'd love to tell you, we did all this because we knew it was the best, yeah, <laughs> the wisest choice. But I, for the most part, didn't see a need to be involved in a lot of that because their dad has always been a very active parent. Like he was, he's always been the go-to parent um, right. in our house, in those kids' lives. You know, I appreciated that and that worked really well for me. And again, I think, Lori, a lot of it has to do in our case with the fact that when we met, I I had just decided I didn't want to have kids. So in other words, I wasn't confronting this tension between finding my role in the lives of kids who weren't my kids, wrestling with the fact that I desperately wanted to be a mother. I didn't have that piece of it. And so instead, I was approaching it as like, I'm an extra person in these kids' lives. And I get to have the fun job of getting to know them and adding something new to our family dynamic. Now, because they were little, they were still young, I'm all I'm still a grown up in the house. And so right. we certainly had, I would say the toughest moments of decision making for me would be things like dad's not right there. And one of them wants to put on a cape and fling himself off a piece of furniture. I'm not going to just sit idly by and let, you know, safety issues <laughs> happen. But no, we but call we, that adulting. <laughs> it, I was the adult on the scene. And so I'm not going to stop being the adult just because right. I'm in a stepmom role. But yeah, we were always pretty, pretty clear on that along the way. And that there was just never really a reason to change that. So have you had any issues with the ex? Do y'all get along well? Are you in, you know, communication with the ex? Or do you stay out of that too? I stay out of it. We're Girl, you came in doing everything right. <laughs> <laughs> through, through, you know, despite my best efforts, I'm sure. But yeah, I think... Part of how I, okay, my perspective on this is that this is one of those situations where step moms in particular get a ton of unsolicited advice. And I would just say pressure from people outside the family to do certain things because it's, I'm doing a little air quotes that you can't see, but it's just the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And be one the of mom. those, yeah, be the mom, mm -hmm. love them like they're your own, mm -hmm. which like, but never mind that that doesn't even make sense for people like me who had no of their own to compare that to. So right. that's not a helpful thing to say no. to people navigating this role. But also, I really don't appreciate when people place a lot of pressure on the adults in a step family to quote unquote, be friends. I'm talking like, you got to do everything together. You have to go on vacation together. You have to because oh, that's way too much. Not only is it not realistic, and there's some really interesting accounts. I love hearing from grown stepkids reflecting back on how the grownups in their lives manage things like this. I love hearing their perceptions of, you know, was it helpful if they were friends? Did you prefer they were friends? I'm talking their, their split parents, but also step parents in the mix. And right. The headline message seems to be kids want what's real. And so if by some turn of events, the parents have split and they find that they are able to be genuine friends in the context of co-parenting, great. Mm -hmm. But that is for, for some really good reasons, that is not realistic for many families. Right. Right. And I would put step parents in the mix as well. So in my case, I'm not friends. I'm not, I'm not close with my stepkids' mom, but I will never, I mean, if we're at a situation where, you know, we interact, I'm going to treat her with the same level of kindness and respect as I would anyone else who I'm interacting with. And that's, you know, I, I understand there are lots of reasons why that's hard for certain people, depending on how much water has gone yeah. under that bridge, right? Yeah. But for me, where I've landed with it is it's genuine to be to be cordial and to keep the focus on the kids, which is what's connecting all the grownups in a step family anyway. And it's more effective because when we force people to put too much priority on friendship, 
like forcing a friendship in my mind is just as ineffective as trying to force love for your partner's kids. Right. You you treat them a certain way, focus on your behaviors and what kind of energy you're bringing to the interactions with them and let the natural emotions like affection and love follow if it's yes. going to follow. Right. If it's going to follow. Yeah. That's my perspective anyway. And I like that perspective and I agree with that perspective 100%. Yeah. I know that, I don't know what you know about nacho kids, but one of the things that I found really interesting is when you first started talking, you were talking about the portable skills. Yeah. And you got those skills to help you through your blended family Mm. or step family because you went to therapy. Yeah. And a lot of times people don't understand that these skills, yes, they are great for your step family issues and step parent issues and all that, but you can use them outside of life. <laughs> yeah. Outside of life. You can use them outside of the blend and in regular life. Yes. And you will without even trying. Once right. You- Once you've tasted the magic of being able to deploy a skill in the right situation and in the right way, it it becomes a habit. And pretty soon you're doing it at work in a tough, you know, conversation, or you're doing it with a member of your family of origin, or you're doing it sitting behind the wheel in traffic. I Mm -hmm. mean, that's one of the simplest, like sometimes a client, you know, I'll start working with a stepmom and she's like, where do you even start with the skills? Like how long does it take to to develop these skills? And it's like, as long as it takes, it takes as long as it takes, but listen, let's lower the bar for what counts as a skill. I'm talking something as simple as emotion regulation. So for mm-hmm. example, right. Yes. At the time that we're having this conversation, lots of families are heading back to school. A big stressor that I hear from a lot of the stepmoms I work with is kids events you know, where you're going to have an opportunity to be there either on the sidelines or at the performance or at the back to school night or whatever. How do I decide what it's like, should I go? Should I hang back? What should I do with myself when I'm there? Where should I stand? It Mm -hmm. kicks up all these questions. And that's to go back to earlier in our conversation where I was talking about, you'll never run out of problems if that's what you're looking for. Right. A stepmom could very easily sit there and and have a checklist of 20 decisions she has to make about navigating back to school properly. Mm-hmm. When if she would just take that same energy and put it into learning how to regulate her nervous system in the moment, how to how to tolerate feeling a little bit of awkwardness or distress and get really good at doing that then she, no matter what she decides, is going to be able to stand there at the sporting event or whatever and tolerate the discomfort more gracefully. Or if she decides to stay home, she's not going to sink her whole evening into pacing around wondering if she made the right choice. She's going to be able to stomach that feeling of a little uncertainty. Right. But it doesn't end there. Like you said, then she's going to She's going to be able to not throw a conniption fit when she's in a long line at the grocery store or when someone cuts her off on the road. These are the most portable skills because they're life skills. Exactly. I know that when we created Nacho Kids, it wasn't with the intention of having all these life skills in there. (laughs) But I know I can't tell people how much better my life is in general because I don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah. And that's what a lot of it boils down to. And one of the questions that I had asked on the questionnaire, your response was about control. Mm. And that is one of the biggest things that I've learned with this whole step family journey. And I have gained so much wisdom in this journey. I feel like I've gained 80 years of wisdom in 15 years. Right. Because I've learned how to control those emotions. I've learned to give things the proper emotional weight. I've learned to take things for what they are in the moment Mm. or just look at things from the stepkids' perspective. A lot of it's perspective. And I have to say, sometimes if we 
take the situation and we back completely out of it, we can see where we are putting the problems in to the blend. Yes. And that is when you can start working on yourself and make all these changes. All these things that I did for our quote, quote, step family, (laughs) I couldn't have done anything better for me as a person. Right. Like, I, I just, I don't know how to explain it. I'm not the same person I was. It's, I'm less stressed. I don't um, get as riled up about things. I'm not on edge. I'm not anticipating what may or may not happen. And we do still have stepkid challenges, we'll say. Yeah. But I have those tools to, number one, not freak out about it, but to walk me through that process. And so many people feel that or believe that not showing is just disengaging. And that's just one of the main things. It's Mm -hmm. to release the pressure. And I don't even like the word disengaging. I look at it as more of stepping aside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But once you realize what you can and can't control, there is power in that. There's such power and there's, there's freedom in it. Like you said, I mean, when you describe everything that you've gained, (laughs) Over the time that you've been a stepmom, I mean, what an incredible picture of growth. Mm-hmm. And I feel I felt that too in my own story. It's like I like to use the metaphor often. I use it with clients of dropping the rope. And that doesn't mean necessarily a tug of war with another person, like another member of your step family. Sometimes it's a tug of war with <laughs> fate. It's like you're trying to wrestle a different outcome out of your situation. And sometimes if you can just learn to set the rope down. At first, it feels like you're giving up, like you're conceding defeat. But then you look down and you realize your hands are all cut up and it's because you've been pulling on it so hard. Mm -hmm. And once you can set it down, then guess what? You've got two free hands and you can go do whatever you want. There's freedom in that because now you're allowing, you know, I think a powerful question that any anyone can ask themselves, but for sure a stepmom who like me, it was kind of prone to overthinking and over-functioning, especially Mm -hmm. early on, is ask yourself, what natural outcome might I be preventing by being involved? And if I could sidestep, as you say, or set down the rope, what are kind of a sequence of events that might unfold? Maybe that problem that I've been anticipating won't even come to pass at all. Or maybe it will, and the painful outcome of that will teach the other people involved to make a different choice next time. Either way, you're free. Right. Yes. I like that. Dropping the rope. Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. How close are you to your parents and stuff? They're, They're all in California. Okay. And I'm here in Minnesota. And so that was one of the big... Honestly, that was one of the big worries I had early on when I was contemplating step family life was, will I be able to take on this role so far away from kind of my first primary support system? Right. And one of the ways, although it's not the same, one of the things I I gained through this relationship is my husband's family. They're all very close. They're They're physically close by near us, and they're also a very close family. Um, And so I sort of, I was married into that. And in that way, I've had a lot of that sort of wraparound family support as we've navigated different phases of life. But Oh, that's good. Yeah. I know it's a whole other conversation, but challenges come up for sure. I remember now you moved because of work. I did. Yeah. And so that's why when we first met, I didn't. I didn't even know how long I'd be staying here. I kind of expected I'd be moving back to California. That was my plan, but the best laid plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Now, how did you, okay, so you've got all these degrees and all this stuff, right? Mm Mm-hmm. What are all your degrees in? So they're not they're not that many degrees. Okay. It's uh <laughs> well, girl, I tell you what, I'm impressed. Go ahead. <laughs> it's all clinical psychology. So I've got a I've got a doctorate. I have a PhD in clinical psych and I'm a licensed psychologist. So I should be calling you Dr. Michaela. 
Yeah, I was I was hoping you'd rectify that. Yeah. Well, I was actually going to try to the last name again, and I said I shouldn't push it. I got it right the first. Time. Yeah, please don't. The name's long enough as it is. We don't need to add more letters. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome though. But what made you get out of doing that into helping step families? I, like the things that I'm interested in, and what first drew me to psychology and kept me fascinated by it has not changed whatsoever. If anything. You know, I'm someone who <laughs> who doesn't always see kind of that golden thread connecting all my different experiences until I'm looking at it in the rearview mirror. When I'm in it, it looks messy and kind of directionless. And so even when I was on kind of more of a prescribed psychology path, it still felt a little all over the place to me because I couldn't make up my mind about what I wanted, or I shouldn't say I couldn't make up my mind. I didn't want to be limited to just one type of work. So my my particular training, by the time you're done, you're equipped to do research at the university level. Mm -hmm. You can teach. You can work clinically with people in like a therapy practice or a hospital. Right. You could have your own practice. All of which I did. I did all of that. Right. And I loved it. For me, increasingly, the the gap between my personal life as a stepmom and my professional life as a psychologist, I always saw those as really distinct parts of me. Mm -hmm. And the older I've gotten, the more I see <laughs> the blend between the two. It's really hard for me to differentiate. Like, in other words, once I became a part of a step family, I didn't like check that at the door when I'd go into my practice. Right. And I've always been a psychologist embedded within a step family from the, from the moment I became a stepmom. I was already a psychologist. And so I never really take that hat off. And so for me, it was almost like nothing had really changed. I just started seeing it as holistically connected, all the different parts of me. And so in some ways, Lori, it was like one day I just rounded a corner and realized this has all been my life's work. I just wasn't, I thought I was clocking out when I'd go home. I didn't realize I was actually putting into practice all the same skills I've had training to help people with. And so mm -hmm. it felt really, really good when I made the jump to full-time supporting stepmoms. And I think moving outside of a therapy, although there are lots of wonderful people who work as a therapist supporting members of step families. For me, I appreciate the flexibility I have within a coaching model. First of all, not having to work within like a diagnostic model. We could mm -hmm. be more proactive, more skills focused, but also I could work with step moms all over the place, which is yeah. just amazing to me. And that's, that's a big difference is that geographically I'd be much more limited in the older model of what I was working with then. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about that aspect of it. Yeah. When you had your clinical training, you were able to put it into practice with your stepkids. Yes. And that is definitely beneficial because you had a lot of help before you got there. I did. And earlier you mentioned something about, and I'd have to look back to find it exactly, but basically trying to explain to the stepkid, well, for my clinical research of panic yeah. attack, blah, 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 <laughs> versus you having gone through it. Yeah, we used to joke, one of my stepsons and I would say, like, it's not just what I do for work. I'm also in the club. And we'd have like a little winky face. Like, we both know what anxiety feels like. Yeah. And be because of that, and I will say, this is kind of more of just like a broader comment for anyone who's listening. And maybe, maybe is earlier on in the blending process and feeling like I felt back then a heightened sense of pressure to like make up for lost time. Like there's these kids, you know, looking back, they were so young, they were three and five, but I felt like I've got, I've got years to make up for and getting to know them. You know, mm -hmm. I was always very clear that I wasn't there to replace anybody, but for me personally, I was like, I want to know everything about them. I want to get to know these kids and I want them to know me, but I didn't have any sort of blueprint for how to do that. And so what I will say is 
I found it most helpful actually to kind of put everything that I knew from school aside and take much more of a beginner's mind approach to getting to know them. And so that's oh. like a a piece of advice I would offer anyone in this role is don't worry about playing catch up or trying to like front to the kids that you know more about things that they're into or impress them in different ways. Me. Approach them like they are fascinating because right. they are and make it your mission to just have a front row seat to whatever they want to share with you. And so with, depending on their ages, that's going to look different, right? If you're coming on the scene and trying to connect with teenagers versus little kids, but the principles are kind of the same. You are the expert on you. You educate me. Like, I want to know what lights you up. I want to get to know you. And then my kind of second related piece of advice connected to that is give yourself the freedom to let individual relationships with your stepkids evolve independent of one another. Do not place pressure on yourself to blend in the same way or in the same timing with each member of your family because it just can't be done. Yes, 100%. You found that too? Yes, with my stepkids. Well, even throughout the nacho process, I had yeah. to nacho some differently than I did the others. But I never had the I missed out feeling with the kids. Hmm. And maybe that's because I had my own kid. Yeah, I wonder how much of that, how much of that played a role. It could also just be, you know, personality differences, but. Well, and two, I guess my kids or my stepkids, I came into their lives when they were, I met David the day the triplets turned eight. Okay. So they were a good bit older. Yeah. Did you move into the home that he shared with his ex? I did. It sucks, doesn't it? I was going to say, Laura, you could do a whole episode just on that if you haven't already. No, let's do that. Let's not talk <laughs> about it too much. And we're going to do that. Yeah. Well, that's that's one of those things I have in mind when I tell people that this role, because people want to know, oh, stepmotherhood, that must be so hard. And I'm like, it's complicated. But what's hard is that it will put you in situations where you're going to have to get to know insecurities and worries that you didn't even know you had. Yep. And that is hard. Having to take a hard look at yourself is hard. Mm -hmm. It is. So yeah, that's one of those domains where for sure. All right. That's what we're going to do. Okay. So next time we have you back, we're going to talk about moving into the house your partner shared with their ex. I love it. Because a lot of stepmoms do. Yes. And a lot of people dismiss how hard that is. Yeah. Yeah. Or I've heard people give kind of generic advice about how you can change up the house and make it feel better for you. And I think that's, I've got a lot of thoughts on <laughs> how to approach it so that it's good for everyone. Yeah. I do too. Oh, this yeah, is going to be good. This is going to be good. All right. Well, Michaela, I will talk to you forever. We already know that. Yes. Thank you very much for being a guest on our podcast. Thank you, Lori. I loved being here. Oh, and tell people where they can find you. I completely forgot that part too, because you're the anxious stepmom, right? I'm the anxious stepmom. And if it's all right yes. with you, Lori, I think I'll create a dedicated landing page on my site for your audience. So, and, and there I can put just like a couple of resources related to things we're talking about, just sort of like free goodies that they can dive into. How does that sound? That sounds awesome. So what do you think as far as a... A URL. How about the anxious stepmom.com slash nacho? Mm -hmm. Or nacho kids. It doesn't matter. Nacho kids. Yep. We'll do nacho kids, all one word. All right. That sounds great. <laughs> and then yes, I'm I'm at the anxious stepmom all over online. It, but you're mostly on TikTok, is that right? Yes. My younger stepson inspired me to start a TikTok account there. So that's a whole nother story. Oh, well, we got to find out about that too. Well, let me ask you, <laughs> when did you start doing stepmom stuff? Well, I started working with stepmoms and step families through my therapy practice. So this was many years ago. Okay. I've been doing it, yeah, for the better part of, you know, the last decade, but, or the last, you know, six or seven years. But in this current iteration, like the anxious stepmom, uh, just a couple of years now. So I've been loving it. Oh, good. Well, great. Well, we are definitely going to have you back and everybody go check out the anxious stepmom. <laughs>
Thanks, Lori. Thanks. All right, y'all. We know it was a long intro, so we're not going to have a long outro because yeah. we don't want you to panic. That's right. Don't panic. I don't want to panic. <laughs> All right. Catch us again next week and make sure that you always remember that life is good when you nacho. Know